Thank you, Lenray. Just, uh, just uh, this for me is an absolute delight. Uh, this is the, the dream team that we have up here. So I actually am going to introduce each one and have each one come up, and I'd like a big clap for that. I have never seen uh, you know, five people who are doing more for Africa, five young people than the group today here. So I want to invite up Melissa Trovada Darko, who's the uh, big executive of the IH IHS Towers. Please come up, give her a big hand. Juliet uh, A. Muon, who is the country director for West Africa for Google, which we've all heard of. Please, Juliet, come up. Uh, I'd like to invite up Dr. Precious Lunga, who is the co-founder of a very, and CEO of a very interesting company making a big difference in Africa, Bow Bob Circle. She'll tell you all about it. Thank you. Come up, Dr. Precious. I'd like to invite up uh, Ife Oyodele II, who's the co-founder of another famous uh, technology company in Africa, Kobo360. Please come up, Ife. <laughs> and finally, I'd like to invite up uh, Milka Wachiuri, who's uh, from Kenya and is the chief growth officer of an amazing company. Many of you have heard about uh, cellulant technology. Please, Milka, come up on this. So I just, I think this is incredible, you'll hear from all about them. I'm very happy to say that our panel has got uh, gender diversity. Uh, so I see so many uh, accomplished women in science. Uh, it also has geographical diversity. I'll let each of them tell you where they're from as well. Uh, the only thing I'm gonna say is that uh, sitting, I've been in Lagos for a decade now. Uh, it's my home, I'm paid in Naira. I pay 21% on my mortgage. I have nowhere to go, so I'm totally committed to, to Africa and to Lagos and Nigeria. Uh, the only thing I will say is, um, in Africa, the challenges that we have are only solvable through innovation. We cannot deliver health care, we cannot deliver education, we cannot deliver financial services to two billion people in Africa uh, in 2050 in the uh, old way. To give a very small example, in developed countries, we have this model of 500 doctors, sorry, 500 patients each doctor. It is not mathematically possible to deliver in that way. So I'm going to come over to the panel and get them started on this. I think it's going to be a fantastic conversation. We'll try to save a little bit of time at the end to get some, some, some questions. Um, uh, and if I'm a bad moderator, it's just because I'm listening so hard. We were up in the green room. We had a fantastic conversation about so many of these issues. So please, let's get started. I'm still on, right? Okay. So I want to start by asking each panelist just to tell us a little bit about their company themselves and their company and what they are doing with innovation to make a difference uh, with Africa. So let me start with Melissa. Hi. So um, I work for IHS Towers. We are not technically a tech company. We are an infrastructure company that helps uh, tech companies doing what they want to do. So for those not familiar with uh, IHS, uh, we uh, build um, telecom towers and lease space um, on, on those towers to MNOs and other actors. Um, innovation, like we obviously innovate within our sector to provide the best services uh, to uh, our clients. But what I would say is that one of the biggest and maybe more relevant for this panel is that we enable uh, other actors to be innovative and, and uh, portray their innovation, it being by um, releasing capital uh, for um, the companies that sell their towers to us. Uh, or leasing spaces with services to companies that come uh, on our infrastructure. So Melissa, just before, before you finish, um, I mean, IHS has an incredible impact on, on uh, connectivity in Africa, but two questions for you. Uh, how many countries are you in, and where are you from? Um, I'm from Sao Tome and Principe, uh, one of the smallest uh, countries in Africa. I sound French because I lived in Paris, but that's where I come from and I'm based here. In terms of IHS, we're in five African countries. So uh, Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, Cameroon, uh, Rwanda and Zambia. We just ventured in the Middle East, but not relevant for this panel. Juliet. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm Juliet. I run our, the Google business across West Africa. and. Um, We've, we've recognized to a large extent the opportunity that exists in Africa. 
and we've taken a long-term view of our business. Um, we've been working primarily with different stakeholders to help to build the digital ecosystem. Our strategy around innovation is based around three pillars. The first is access, which is really looking at, we know that there's an infrastructure deficit in our region. When you talk about power, broadband access, and the fact that a lot of people are still using low spec feature phones. And so we have an initiative called Next Billion Users, which is really looking at how do you innovate specifically for the next billion users coming online with an understanding that the bulk of them will be coming from Africa and other emerging markets. And so we've been building products specifically for um, the tailor to the needs of the region, for example, building products that can work effectively offline and online, products that work well on low spec feature phones, um, products that have uh, very light apps that can be um, that can work on phones that have limited storage, those types of innovations. And um, also last year we launched public, a public Wi-Fi service called Google Station in collaboration with uh, local ISVs. The second pillar of our strategy is around skills development. So developing capacity at scale is really critical to be able to drive and sustain the ecosystem. And so we've been um, investing in providing digital skills education. We pledged in 2017 to provide free digital skills training to 10 million Africans in five years. We're halfway there. And it includes in-depth uh, in training for 200,000 developers. As part of this as well, we're providing support to technology startups. We've seen a rise in entrepreneurial activity on the continent. And um, we, we launched an accelerator program, which is a three-month mentoring program, including grants and provision of infrastructure to really support these startups in, in growing and developing themselves further, as well as support for local tech hubs. The third pillar of our strategy is around local content. There's amazing local content in Africa from you know, creative content, entertainment content, business information, uh, look, places of interest, etc. And we've been working with a, 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 a lot of partners around bringing all of that great content online. So that's a summary of the bulk of work that we've been doing. So Juliet, I mean, Google's in every country, so you don't need to answer that question, but uh, where are you from? I'm from Nigeria. Nigeria, okay. What really impresses me about Google is they've come to Africa and they're building solutions for Africa, in Africa, on that, so fantastic. Dr. Lunga, tell us about Baobob and yourself, and I think what you're doing is incredible. Thank you, so my name is, is Precious Lunga, and uh, we set up Baobab Circle because there's a big problem across the African continent right now, and it's around non-communicable diseases. It's a really long name, but basically, think diabetes, high blood pressure, equals strokes, amputations, and blindness. So 25% of adult Africans actually suffer from high blood pressure. It's a big problem for our continent because we're not geared to deal with these chronic health conditions. And so what we're seeing are these terrible complications. So we developed a platform called AFIAPAP, which actually delivers support for people with these chronic conditions. Whether you have a smartphone or you have a basic phone, we're able to actually monitor you remotely and ensure that you actually do not get those terrible complications. We're also using data, and with that data, we're able to then connect you to your doctor if you need to, and also to help your health insurance provider, for example, deliver those services to you and make the payments because we're providing a more efficient system to actually prevent the complications. So Dr. Longa, how many countries are you in now? And where are you from? What, what's your uh, heritage? Okay, my heritage. So my heritage is I'm, I'm from Zimbabwe. I'm half Zimbabwe and half Congolese. Um, and we're in four countries. We're in Kenya, we're in Zambia, we're in Tanzania, and we're in Zimbabwe. Fantastic. Uh, Ife, Kobo360. Hi everyone, uh, so Kobo360, uh, simply put, we are Uber for trucks in Africa. Uh, what we do is we have a tech-enabled logistics platform that connects uh, cargo owners uh, with the truck suppliers who are able to, to solve that capacity for them. And uh, my partner and I, my co-founder and I, we moved in to solve that logistics problem in Africa. Uh, what we saw was that there was, no, there was a lack of capacity in uh, the large enterprises being able to supply their products to the 200 million citizens uh, in Nigeria, which we started out from. 
And so what we did was started to aggregate all the trucks on our platform, and we sort of merged technology with the traditional way of doing business in Africa. So like, uh, like Lunga, like Ms. Lunga, Dr. Lunga, we also use, the drivers can use touchstone phones, smartphones, and they can accept requests uh, through our platform. Uh, they, uh, we also have trackers on the trucks for proper tracking and monitoring and visibility. And what we also do is uh, to, for, for our drivers, we have a, a lot of value added services partnering with uh, the diesel supply companies, the tire supply companies, uh, all plugged into our platform uh, to drive efficiency and optimization uh, in logistics. Uh, we serve several large enterprises like Olam, Unilever, Dangote, DHL. Uh, we're now in four countries. Uh, we're in Nigeria, Ghana, Togo, and Kenya, uh, soon to be in Uganda, Rwanda, before the end of the year. Uh, so it's been an exciting journey so far, and uh, good to be here. And I won't ask your nationality, because everyone in the room knows from your name you're Nigerian. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Milka. So Cellulant, uh, many people here have heard of Cellulant, and there's so many incredible things they're doing, but just, just describe one or two things that Cellulant's doing that is really changing Africa with technology. Yeah. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, Cellulant is really um, started off as a payment business um, in Africa. Um, and we have a network of uh, 90 banks, um, 40 MNOs, and uh, over 600 merchants, um, just uh, offering white label um, and also our own products uh, to consumers and allowing them to make payments across Africa. We've taken this technology now and are sort of building on uh, and innovating on top of it in a very specific area in agriculture. Um, and uh, we, we sort of look at it as the first step of um, innovating on marketplaces um, in Africa. Uh, we, we run this technology uh, primarily in uh, Nigeria today. Uh, we have a database of about 17 million uh, farmers that we registered uh, about maybe five years ago when we worked with the government to uh, give disbursements uh, to, to farmers. Um, and now corporate commodity buyers and um, agro dealers, uh, logistics company, warehousing companies have um, now a platform that they have available to them uh, that is blockchain enabled to allow them to move produce from the farmer to the corporate commodity uh, buyers. So, I mean, that's what we do. Uh, we are in um, 10 markets in Africa uh, today. Um, and uh, so lots of uh, Southern Africa, except South Africa. <laughs> and, uh, and we're in Nigeria, we're in Ghana, we're in Kenya, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Mozambique. Uh, Botswana, uh, Malawi, um, yeah, so about 10 of them, yeah. And what national, where are you from? What's your country? I'm Kenyan. All right, so you've heard for a few minutes from the panel here. To me, this was just amazing. One is just uh, the geographical dis uh, uh, diversity on this panel. And I have to confess, I'm not sure I've ever met someone from Sao Tome that I'm very <laughs> happy to be sharing up with that. But also, if you listen carefully, every one of these startup companies is now in multiple African countries. I mean, I think about in Nigeria how few companies move out. The young innovators are taking their ideas across Africa. It's just incredible. So let me reverse the order. I have a question, which is, I want each panelist, and you can feed off each other, but to describe either an innovation or a technology or a company in Africa you think is really going to make a, a, a huge difference to the uh, well-being of the continent. So I'm going to start with Milka. Blockchain, <laughs> of course. Well, tell us. Um, and the, the reason, um, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, and maybe this is, um, let me say, over-discussed or over-emphasized, but whenever you look at um, Africa and whenever people consider Africa, the word um, corruption, things passing through the wrong hands or never getting to the right person is always a consideration. And um, block blockchain te technology really comes to um, help solve part of this problem, right? As technology is not everything, uh, but a lot of what we've seen, for example, with a, um, a Greek uh, platform is that, that it's now uh, the availability and allowing that there's visibility of what is moving from where, what's the price, um, who, who is um, linked, where is my money, where has it gone, to whom has it gone, how did it come back, and just allowing that visibility from a technology perspective. Okay, if I... Uh, so for me, I think it's more big data and uh, machine learning. For us in Africa, we're seeing that a lot of data is still gathered on a very traditional means. And for us in logistics, we're always on the field uh, dealing with drivers, truck owners, farmers, I mean, 
construction workers, every single person that comes on our platform. And uh, we're now using this data over the last uh, 16 months that we've launched uh, to make, uh, make better decisions. And that's what is driving our, our growth and our expansion. Uh, we had our own idea of what we wanted, what the markets we wanted to expand to, into, but the data we started to gather sort of informed us to take a different direction. And uh, we're now seeing the importance of that and hoping to continue that trend. Uh, we started our own data analytics team, all local, local uh, hires, a very strong team, and we're excited to scale that into uh, beyond just uh, tech for logistics. Wow, Dr. Longa. Um, I'm gonna say connected devices, which actually feeds into the data collection, um, particularly in the area of health. So uh, many of the medications and, and ways of treating people actually uh, were developed based on models that were, you know, tests that were done be it in Europe or in the United States, and most of them on men. And actually what we're doing now with the Internet of Things is that we can actually democratize and get real data and use that real data to, to actually develop algorithms that are relevant for the context. Wow. Okay. I would say artificial intelligence and machine learning. I believe strongly that Africa's biggest challenges will not be solved by traditional methods of the past. With machine learning and artificial intelligence, these problems can be solved in radically different ways, um, a lot faster and even more cost effectively. And that's a way to really accelerate growth. For example, today with a smartphone and a camera, it is possible to predict and prevent severe climate conditions like droughts, uh, uh, detect uh, severe diseases, as well as address issues like financial inclusion for the unbanked. Um, and certainly this is something that we use uh, already in Africa with our products. With Google Maps, for example, we use machine learning and satellite imagery to um, automatically add buildings onto Google Maps, even buildings where the addresses are handwritten, right? Being able to interpret that. And in the last year, we've been able to add 10 million locations onto Google Maps. This would have taken uh, several years without the technology. Wow, I'm speechless. That's why I'm not doing a good job moderating. Melissa. <laughs> uh, I, I would say fiber and any other technology that will support uh, the businesses because we can create whatever we want if um, that cannot reach our phones, our laptops. It's, it's a big loss. Um, data, uh, as we've heard from uh, every panelist, is really important, but we need the means to Use. reach the, the end user. So I think what's interesting about, about the answers you've heard also the businesses, I mean, sometimes when people think about technology in Africa, I mean, for years we've talked about M-Pesa, M-Pesa, I've got uh, M-Pesa fatigue myself. But what's amazing here is the connection between innovation and the physical world. So we've got health tech, which is you know physical person being connected with the technology, the logistics uh, on there, ag tech with the cellulin. What uh, Melissa's company does, IHA's Towers, is an infrastructure company using technology. Um, and so I think that's really critical in the innovation. There's so many dimensions. But you also heard from the panelists how many different technologies we need in Africa, uh, homegrown in Africa, to be able to make this work. So, but let me change directions a little bit. I want to talk about the innovation ecosystem and what is the relationship between the big companies and the little companies, and is it working? Are there gaps, et cetera? So I'm going to start with Google, with Juliet, uh, the biggest uh, one of all. So what's your view <laughs> on how the tech system is working? I think uh, there's a necessary place for multiple players in the ecosystem. So the large multinationals, global organizations, uh, local entrepreneurs, the v international VC firms, local funds, et cetera. I think um, everyone has an important and very vital role to play. Um, if I take the uh, global multinationals, for example, um, these organizations, I would say, bring uh, global best practices and standards also would usually have uh, the financial muscle to be able to make bets and invest particularly in areas around their core business. Um, in, in the work that we do, there's also a lot of uh, enabling the local industries, the local businesses. Uh, I talked about some of the programs that um, we run even with, uh, with startups. Uh, tech hubs, for example, that are an, an integral part of developing the, the technology ecosystem. Um, we support 
not just uh, uh, through funding, but even programs and um, initiatives to stimulate and build the community. So for example, um, in, in Nigeria, we have over 30 <coughs> Google developer groups. Now, we encourage, those groups um, run events, get together, they do hackathons, code jams, uh, training, etc. And we always encourage the use of the tech hubs for these events. That's a way of, one, creating businesses for the tech hubs, but also uh, connecting those communities and making sure that you have that vibrance and that um, uh, knowledge sharing, et cetera. And, the, the, and there are many um, dimensions of this. So I think um, there's, a, there's a very positive and healthy interplay between both organizations. All right, well, let's hear from the startups here. Milka, does it, does it look that way from Cellulance? Cellulance a bit further yeah, than a startup, but, yeah, yeah. but uh, does it look that way, a healthy ecosystem no, for you? I mean, it, it does, it does actually. Um, if you look at a business like Cellulant, for example, I'll give you um, an example of two companies that uh, we are working with today, um, Facebook and uh, ADN, right? Uh, who, because they want to come to Africa, they want to be able to offer uh, what uh, payments or uh, whatever it is that they need uh, in Africa. Um, and Cellulant allows and um, is, comes in almost as a one-stop API uh, center where they can actually be able to provide what they need to in a couple of markets all at once, rather than having to do the, f the full job that we've, uh, we've had to do over the years to connect all these uh, ecosystems. So we, yeah, it's, it's not a, it's a love-hate relationship, I like to say sometimes, uh, which happens a lot uh, because every business is uh, going out to capture the market in uh, various ways. So sometimes collaboration works, sometimes it doesn't. But we've, we've actually seen it working pretty well so far. You're frenemies, but good frenemies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Frenemies in a good way. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So Cobo 360, what does it look, it look like from your Yeah, I don't think it's the same for, for logistics. <laughs> <laughs> I think for us, what we've seen, uh, it's, it's been largely transactional. Um, and I think maybe it's because of the, 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 the sector we're in or the industry and you know, how logistics is. People that, uh, in, for us in Kenya, you know, when you tell somebody that it's actually cheaper to ship things from China to Mombasa than from Mombasa to Uganda, I mean, your head starts to spin. Yeah. And why is that? So for us, we're building uh, what we call a global logistics operating system, something that plugs in all the players in the market. And what we do is that we've decided to go beyond just having a transactional relationship with our clients who are largely manufacturers or uh, production raw material um, movers in, uh, in Africa. And so every once a month or, every, or bi monthly, we have a sit down with them. We show them what the, the numbers are doing, what the data is saying from the business that we transact with them. So, and how do we build a relationship beyond that? And that was what even, so for us now, it was easy for us to roll out with our existing customers to other markets uh, because they see us not just as somebody that is transacting and supplying them trucks or, or, or increasing their capacity, but more as a partner as we scale across uh, Africa and, and they scale as well. Okay, so let me shift gears a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about how the government is supporting or not supporting innovation. Um, and Melissa, I want to start with you on this issue because, uh, I mean, I, what you do, IHS Towers, is not easy. Uh, you know, towers all across the country on that. So how, how does IHS feel about, you know, we're, I guess, more or less Chatham House rule, but to feel, feel, feel about the government support for what you're doing, dealing with the government on these issues to, to roll out what you do? We need the government, uh, and, and, and there's a lot of communication because the tower co-business is something new in most of the markets where we are. We were the first tower co, so we need to find a way uh, to work together and we are at the frontier of a lot of things. We are an infrastructure company, but we do telecoms. Telecoms, depending when you go on market, you have concerns about uh, sometimes national security because yeah, telecom, phones, you don't know. We are at the frontier of uh, real estate because obviously our towers are on land. And also we are building capacity and to the point of Juliet, we uh, also need to train people. We are not a company that can be, we don't have a business that we can run out of London. Uh, we need to be on the ground. Um, so th there's a lot of uh, talk. Um, uh, I think there's a, a, there's a big uh, push uh, because the government see the value 
we are uh, maybe um, less of a name than Google uh, or uh, an Airtel or an MTN that are client of ours, but without us, or with us, we uh, increase visibility and, and we help the government achieve what they want to achieve, and it's something that is really important. Everyone uses their phone every so you've day. you've had generally positive experience with governments in supporting this innovation. <laughs> Um, oh, we that, like to see we much? like to see the glass half full. Okay. I'm not saying that uh, it's a, a walk in the park every day, but um, everyone needs to collaborate. So yeah. Okay, but, uh, Dr. Lunga, what does this look like from your viewpoint? Um, Government supporting startups. Also, you're in the healthcare business. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I I think I'd say there's government and government. So we work closely with the ministries of health in those countries, and of course, the Ministry of Health immediately sees the need and really wants, you know, wants us to roll this out with them. And so we work very well with them. And they put, they're quite good in, well, particularly Kenya, for example, is quite good, has a, has a, a conscious sort of e-government policy. So they have a, a really clear strategy on how they want to, to, to use technology. Then on the other side is, I mentioned that we also have connected devices, for example. So that then goes into the realm of, of, sort of the customs end of government, which is not really health. So how do you connect those different parts of government in order to facilitate the whole ecosystem, which I think is important because at the moment, in some countries, it, it costs so much to import the goods that at the end of the day, by the time it gets to the end user, it's so expensive that you may be endangering someone's life because they cannot afford um, that particular commodity. And we see this happening over and over again. So, so it's really around the need to actually have a, a connectivity across the government as well in creating a, an, an ecosystem that is um, friendly for innovation. Your faith, your viewpoint on the government enabling or dis disabling uh, innovation. Yes, yeah, so uh, with COBO, I mean, of course, again, in logistics, uh, we definitely need a lot of government intervention. Uh, for instance, customs, like you mentioned, we have to, moving, moving goods across border, we have to deal with customs officials, uh, just at least 15 stops between, to give you an example, between Nigeria to Togo, we stop, we stopped 15, 20 times. But when you move from Ghana to maybe uh, Togo or Togo to Ivory Coast or Burkina Faso, maybe you get one or two stops. And at those stops, these drivers are being extorted, they are being delayed, well, uh, customers' goods are being delayed, reducing productivity and things like that. And when it comes to power generation, I mean, uh, connectivity, thank God we have Google and, and uh, IHS here now. Hopefully we can work something out with the government. Uh, but these are things that have stifled the growth of, of our business. And we know what, what the socioeconomic impact we could have if some of these infrastructures were put in place, uh, if we could work with the, with the government directly uh, in sort of issues we face around the ports in Nigeria and in other parts of Africa as well. I mean, we like what the Kenyan government has done with the SGR. Uh, but there's still a lot more implementation that has, has to take place. Again, we're excited with the CFTA coming on board, but we're hoping that implementation and execution actually happens. And it's not just another uh, trade agreement that is on there, but it's not working like ECOWAS. So, if it, let me just ask, though, when, when you, do you engage the government on these issues? Oh, yes. What, what sort of react? I mean, does it help to engage them? <laughs> not... Mm, <laughs> maybe I should look at the glass half full, but um, <laughs> um, I... Th it just doesn't move fast enough, you know, and, and you see for us in the startup and entrepreneurial space, given our growth over the past 17 months, we know how fast we can grow. We know how fast we can improve uh, the conditions of our businesses, of the, of, the, of, the, of the drivers and the truck owners that are on our platform, and the government is just not moving fast enough. And some of the conversations we've had two years ago are still conversations on the table, and we're still going back and forth. So. Hopefully now that we have a sort of direct relationship with multinationals that have more influence and direct relationship with the government, maybe that can further the implementation process faster. Milka, do you have a view from Yeah, uh, Yeah. The, the problem we have, and it's a huge one actually, it's more um, that if you, if you find the right person, the right individual, right? Not necessarily uh, corrupt, but the right person as, a, as an individual, they're driven by something different. The former, the now AFDB president was the minister or the PS in, uh, in agriculture when we were getting our contract. So nothing about corruption, he was just invested as a person, 
right? Not about the system, just him as an individual. So you find that real, the real problem is the divorce of the system and the individual. Because as long as the individual wants the job, that fine, right? They will push for it. Um, and you know, when he got promoted to AFDB, the project died with him, yeah. right? So that's, that's just it, that the system and the people are divorced. Right, um, and that's a big thing. Uh, but interestingly, also, you, I mean, you find it also in the um, uh, in the positive. Uh, the Kenya Revenue Authority now in in Kenya is having discussions with Cellulant, and we're having conversations with them, saying there are a lot of these businesses that want to come uh, to Africa. They want to offer services in Africa. They do not want to be uh, to be registered in Africa. I don't need a business uh, registered in Africa to offer digital services, right? So how then, and I want to pay taxes. I do want to pay taxes. But you've not actually put the infrastructure in place to allow us to be able to charge that tax. And it's not even about just charging the tax. It's about policy. Because if you're charging 15% um, withholding tax on services, for example, margins on payments are very thin, mm -hmm. right? So you can't charge 15% like normal, right? So there's, there's a lot of conversation there. Uh, the good thing is that this one is also interesting for them because it means more revenue. So they invested, right? Mm -hmm. So it just, I think the real thing is the, yeah, just the divorce between the person, personal interest, and the government, right? I they're also, waking up. I, I also think just all of you, when you explain your technology or your innovation, it's so complex. It's very difficult for government officials to keep up with yeah. this information I overload. So just we'll end many times, this. many times they say no to many things because they don't understand, <laughs> they don't understand them, right? right? <laughs> Rather than anything else. Right. So you have two, two speeds of Africa: the government speed and the speed <laughs> of uh, the young people up here on this panel. All right, Julia. Let me ask you: What does this look like from Google's viewpoint? And, and you're a big company. Well, <laughs> because they come. How are you influencing governments to embrace innovation and go faster? Yeah, so pl government plays a very important role in creating an enabling environment for technology growth. And we, one, of our, one body of work that we've taken on is actually um, engaging with government, uh, providing uh, ad advocacy, uh, training, obviously, as well, because uh, some of the digital concepts that we're working with are relatively new. Uh, the markets are not uh, um, at the level of maturity that they can, uh, they can be at. And so um, there's a lot of that interaction. And we've seen increased interest from government and an understanding and appreciation of the fact that technology is pivotal to growth. Right? And we've seen some initiatives. So to your point about separating the individual from the uh, institution, unfortunately, it's hard to do that on a sustained basis because administrations change. Um, a few years ago, um, the government was very, uh, in, in the technology space, very active in, in Nigeria, for example, around um, getting the private sector and the public sector together to develop strategies. So um, there was a, an effort around developing a technology incubation strategy. We were part of that uh, committee. There were other private sector organizations as well as government agencies, um, and also to develop the national broadband plan, mm. which was really aimed at accelerating broadband growth and removing the obstacles. There was momentum in executing these strategies, but then we had a, a change in government, and um, you know the mo momentum was not sustained. So that's another challenge that uh, that we experienced. So we're seeing uh, increased support and appreciation, but things can be uh, can can move faster. Okay, fantastic. So let's just go to another another um, topic here. I want to talk about um, the advent, like the all these innovation centers, cloud computing, open source. Is that having an impact? Is that a helping to accelerate uh, the growth and innovation? And maybe we'll start with, uh, with Milka again. Yeah, um, I think the jury is out there uh, a little on, uh, I mean, when, especially when I look at uh, cloud, uh, cloud for sure. I mean, that, that, that goes without saying it has made work easier. Uh, you're able to collaborate better. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, let me just um, possibly look at, um, I, uh, hubs, uh, innovation hubs more. Um, I think just either looking at them from a funding perspective in the way they are funded uh, today uh, makes it very, um, let's say, nice to have um, things happening or activities going on uh, in the hubs rather than uh, something that says at the end of um, what we need to do in this hub, uh, do these companies actually uh, get out and become businesses that can actually sustainably run um, in, um, um, in, in the continent? And 
I mean, there's some few uh, examples that have started uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, becoming real actual businesses that uh, are, are operating. Uh, but I've actually found that most of, most of those are you know, those that are, say, funded by people like Google. So Google is personally invested, and Pesa is personally invested. Safaricom has done a couple, and they are personally invested. So that really, they move uh, when that happens. Uh, but I've, I think, to me, the jury is still out there on how successful they are today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Listen, do you have a view on this? I think it helps building capacity. Um, I think the biggest asset, and it's the view of my CEO of Africa, is its people. People want to do things. They are motivated. And um, as we were discussing uh, with the panel before joining here, we are solution-oriented. We're like, in Africa, we have so many issues um, that we need to solve that when a new product is created, the product is most of the time created to address an issue that we face day to day. So I think there's room for improvement, for sure. Um, I think there's a lot of um, uh, hubs that are funded by private companies, but I also think that the governments, to go back to the point earlier, are realizing that they have also um, their role to play, so um, and they are creating and encouraging companies uh, to build capacity in the countries together with them. So we see increases, increasingly uh, more uh, asks from the regulator to come and train people with them. And Julia, Google's view, I mean obviously you support these hubs, but do you see them as just people building capacity or you think we're going to see some big companies come out of them or, or not quite working as Milka says? I think they're a very important part of the ecosystem because if you uh, consider the fact that we have infrastructure challenges as an example, um, innovation hubs provide an opportunity to localize world-class infrastructure and also drive um, uh, collaborative working, networking, as well as skills development. And um, we've, we have seen some very viable um, entrepreneurial businesses come out of existing tech hubs. Um, we have to watch and see how, how far they go, but um, uh, uh, there are some that seem to be um, doing quite well and uh, are likely to be successful in the long term. I think that they are, um, relative to the population, we don't have enough of them, mm -hmm. and the existing ones need more support. Okay, thank you for that. So let's. Um Turn to a, uh, I hope the final question before we qu uh, go to the audience. Um, I wanted to ask, I know the answer to the question, but I want to know what you would do about it. So the question is, is there enough venture capital to support the innovation we need in Africa? I think the answer is probably no, so <laughs> we have to have the answer. But I want to start Dr. Mlinga. Yeah. Okay, so that's, we know the answer. It's no. What do you do about <laughs> it? Um, I think just linking on to the, um, um, what Julia was saying about the innovation hubs, is that when you create an ecosystem where you spin out an idea, it's really important to actually then see it through its, its cycle and that it can take time. And when, if, if you take uh, even sort of Google, you take Amazon as, as an example. With technology, what you have now can really transform the future. Some, some, some of the technologies that are, be that are being developed now we may not even know what impact they're going to have until it really happens. That's why it's called the fourth industrial revolution. And so I think actually being able to fund not just at the seed level, but when there's a little bit of traction, but not yet a fully established business is where there's a big gap across the African continent. And so you have um, ideas that are, that are not succeeding, not because they're good ideas, not because it's not a good team, but because that, fun, that funding gap isn't there to help elevate that company onto the next step. Ife, one, one minute on this before question. Yes, there's, there's a lot of capital. Uh, there's enough capital to fund all the, all the projects that are going on in Africa. We, in the last 17 months that we've been around, I think there's, there's pre pretty much no major investor we haven't spoken to from SoftBank to the Sequoias. And their own fear, as, as is with the theme of this, uh, this uh, uh, forum, is uh, business uncertainty in Africa. Mm -hmm. So they love our trajectory, they love our growth, they love our business model, but they're just not sure about the continent, they're not sure about, about Africa as a whole. And so that's where this conversation about working with uh, the public sector, working with the multinationals to actually put policies in place that would weather the storm when these so-called business uncertainty comes into play, 
that would excite these investors more. I mean, we saw the growth in, in, our, in our foreign direct investments over, over the last two years, and we think it can keep on growing at, at that rate if there's some sort of guarantee, there's some sort of safety net, there's some sort of view that things are working faster with the help of the multinationals and with the, with the help of the public sector. Okay, I mean, we heard from the, uh, Nikki, the CEO of the um, Stock Exchange, JSE, saying that she spends 40% of her time dealing on Africa Inc. or South Africa Inc., not on Stock Exchange. The same issue here. You spend your time talking about Africa, not your trajectory. Okay, so we have a few minutes for questions. Um, many hands up. We'll take, I don't have a very good memory, and I don't know if I brought a pen. We'll take two questions at a time, and then we'll ask who on the panel wants to. Hi, good afternoon to you all. Thank you to the panelists for an excellent discussion. My name is Kusum Kalyan. I'm from South Africa. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is, uh, no, a question and a comment. The question is, I was listening to you. Um, I'm trying to get the name. Milka. Milka, Milka. Milka, I, I, th I thought that was very thought-provoking what you have said. But my concern is, if you have a, this comes to governance and conflicts of interest, which I'm you know, concerned about, is that if you have a minister vested in your, investing in your, um, in your business, and at the same time, he's part of the regulator, part of, of making the decisions, the policies and all, I think it's a serious conflict of interest that you have to be careful of because uh, if you're looking at for investment or a uh, venture company coming in, it's always very, very difficult if you have someone who's making the rules and at the same time investing in your company. I thought I'll just... Uh, okay, we'll come to that. We'll get Milka to respond to that. Okay, no, I, have oh. an, I, have a, I have a comment to make. Is that every... Go, you know, investors want certainty, they want the regulatory framework to be fair to all companies, and I can declare it, I'm a board director of MTN Group in South Africa. And governments need to provide that kind of certainty and the fairness to all companies that are operating in Africa. Secondly, I would like to say is that governments need to take a very active role in the fourth industrial revolution. I take, for example, our country in South Africa. President Cyril Ramaphosa, even before the elections, formed a committee. And that committee is made up of 30 people cross-sector. And I think we've made so much of advancements, and I think you will see the, the fruits of that coming forward. So I just want to say, I think governments in Africa need to do that with the private sector. Thirdly, on the funding funding the small enterprises, the innovation hubs, the, uh, the, uh, the, the young people that are wanting to create something in the sector, I think companies need to come to the table. We have just taken on a thousand in youngsters to that train That deserves them. a hand for MTN. <laughs> oh, no. This wasn't meant to be a speech, but I thought I should share with you those, no, those all the all good <laughs> work that's been done in Okay, Africa. Milka will answer in a second. One more question, and we'll go. Maybe we'll take it from I, Ambassador Paul, if he's... Uh, I have a very simple question. So, my name is Raj, Raj Kulasingham. I'm from Denton. So, I see a lot of startups talking to me, either as an investor or as an advisor. And it seems to me there's a lot of capital in Africa, uh, and you don't need to go outside Africa. And I think the, the issue is connecting the dots between capital that's on the ground to, and I think this idea that you have to go to Silicon Valley to raise capital, to me, it seems that there is a, actually a lot of capital in Africa, but how do you connect the dots? You just seen recently, there was a company called, uh, I can't remember, in South Africa that raised, was the first company to raise um, on a crowdfunding platform. I can't remember what they were called, but come to me in a minute. But it seems to me that, that there are two problems of getting capital at, at the early stage. One is connecting to the right people on the ground who understand the African, uh, environment, and two is whether or not you can pull in things like crowdfunding. To, and my question is, why why isn't that happening more often? Okay, so Milka, why don't you take the first question, and then the second question we'll have. If, okay, take one more from uh, Ambassador Paul. Okay, please. 
Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Paul Arkwright. Until November last year, I was High Commissioner, British High Commissioner to Nigeria, so I recognise some of the comments from the panel on, on uh, the government. Um, my question is about a different kind of capital, human capital, um, and it's around whether or not you have a sufficiently literate and numerate talent pool um, coming through the local education system to enable you to pick up on Juliet's point about training people and, and skills building and so on. So is there, sufficient, are there, is there a sufficient number of uh, people coming through local education systems who are going to be essential to enable you to scale up? That's the question. Okay, so we've got uh, capital, human capital, but Milka's has got to start with uh, government capture or, or sort of the favoritism, possible favoritism when you find the right guy in the, or girl or woman in the uh, civil yeah, service. Yeah. So first of all, he's, he's not an investor. Um, he's not an investor in the business, so that's, that's critical. Um, and this was really a um, right place at the right time, right? This is someone actually who met my uh, chairman and my co-founder on a plane, and they just started talking about the problems of, of Africa and the issue at hand. They didn't even know he was going for an interview, and after his interview, he called them. That, that thing we were discussing on the plane, uh, I'm now the PS in, uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in the Ministry of Agriculture, and I want to see it happen. So he's not an investor. There is absolutely no conflict of interest. Um, he doesn't work for Cellulant in any way. Um, yeah, so I think the, the point I was trying to make was that if I was appointed as the PS of Ministry of Agriculture in Kenya, for example, I'd be running with this project because then I, I also get to be on the Forbes uh, list of, <laughs> <laughs> like he did, right? So I was just saying that an individual who's very invested from a perspective of, I'd like to see a difference in the work that I do, then they come in and bring in businesses that are actually making that happen. Yes. Okay. Listen, you want to take a crack at Raj's question about cap? I mean, IHS has been very successful at raising cap. <laughs> Thank you, Raj. <laughs> uh, it, it's quite interesting because IHS is now part of the big companies. And, and I, I think we are really proud to be sitting like in the panel of the big companies with Google. But um, for those who don't under, like don't know the IHS uh, history, uh, we were founded in 2001 by uh, three engineers. So I think today, um, given the success of IHS, it's somehow easier to uh, raise capital, but uh, the issues that my fellow panelists had um, existed for IHS uh, when the company started. Um, I, I think a, a few issues are uh, within th that border. When you want to invest in Africa, and it doesn't um, matter if you are looking for $50,000 or 200 million, the compliance point uh, is critical. Uh, even uh, at, at our scale, the amount of time we need to uh, spend with even our existing investors and bankers to discuss compliance issues, conflict of interest, the framework. Um, if you, like it, it's, it's, sometime, it's sometimes difficult and I think that people miss uh, on that opportunity because some people just can't um, reconcile uh, the compliance issue with reputa uh, reputation risk and, and so on and so forth. So I think there's, okay, uh, sometimes uh, that gap that needs to be uh, closed to allow more capital to access the company that did it most. Okay, you want to take a, you, you, you gave the example of your company creating the, the analytics team. So yes, yeah, so, the, so the just, to, just to touch a little bit on, on what Melka said, um, I, I had the opportunity to meet some of the people that worked under the, the minister, and um, I, I was very excited, I was very happy to hear what she said. One of the things that we've struggled with in, in West Africa particularly is business continuity. Mm -hmm. And when government changes hands, the, the prior governments who may have been forward-thinking, assembled a forward-thinking team, <laughs> Uh, but in policies that made sense, that, was, that allowed for better sharing of profits, of, of business, of revenue, and things like that. And then all of a sudden, maybe he moves on to a different uh, sector or a different business, and that thing slows down. Uh, so she was very lucky. Uh, I, I know a lot of companies have benefited from, from having that forward-thinking minister assemble a young team. I know somebody joined from BNP Paribas, 
who is a good friend of mine and now an entrepreneur, uh, because she saw uh, the benefits of being an entrepreneur in, in, a, in an environment where the government enables that. And that touched on what you said about creating uh, a sector, or should I say a team of people with, with the entrepreneurs, with the multinationals and people in the public sector on driving these implementations, these uh, policies that could help uh, scale the continent. And then to touch on, on, on the point of, of capital, I think equity, equity investment, the framework of equity investment uh, in Africa, West Africa particularly, let me say, is, is quite new, and even Africa. Uh, so I've seen a lot of startups who, you know, they went, and even when we started, we, we approached local, local uh, people, high net worth individuals, uh, investors, and they don't understand what it means to give away money for less than 50% of your business or 80% of the business because they, they feel like they're funding your entire operation because without them, you can't start. Uh, so that's one of the things that we've struggled with, uh, with raising equity capital, I mean, for fall, smaller firms like us on like IHS. Uh, equity investment is a very, very new framework, and a lot of companies, uh, startups, have suffered because they took money from an uncle or an aunt who didn't understand what dilution meant and things like that. <laughs> so is that, is that, is that education that, that needs to happen okay, as okay, well? Let me stop you there because we're running out of time. Okay, we have some, we're going to have one more question yeah. from the gentleman, but I want okay. reaction from, um, from Dr. Lunga and Juliet on the human capital. Yeah, after, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. I think in terms of... Uh, human capital, We're, Africa as a continent is blessed with phenomenal yes. capital, yes. human yeah. capital. Um, we don't have a shortage of a pipeline of trained, highly skilled, very motivated, committed to the continent mm -hmm. young people. Yeah. What we lack is actually we need to place those young people in jobs because you could learn data science mm -hmm. at university, but you still need to know how to mm -hmm. build an algorithm in a real life situation, and that's where the gap is. Yeah. Sir, please. So, uh, my name is Zemedi Renegatu. I am uh, global chairman of a private equity firm based in Washington, and we invest quite a bit in the technology space, so I'm speaking more from an investor's perspective. And I was intrigued by the challenges that they say, uh, the, the, these young people here, that they face from governments, and I think we see that as well. I think the way you should frame it, if we want governments to understand the value of what you bring, give them some numbers. We're a numbers-driven organization. I'll tell you something. The digital economy globally is worth $3 trillion, which is worth bigger than the UK GDP. So if you frame it as such, and then you present it to policymakers who actually are, are fearful because look, look at what's the average age of the people in this, in this panel here. It's very young, right? You don't see this kind of leadership in other industries. So you frame it aside, and that's what we do. We've invested in, in a replica of M-Pesa in Ethiopia called Hello Cash. And the way we presented it is, it's the bank they unbanked. Mm. When in a country that, when we started the companies eight years ago, 80, 85% of Ethiopians didn't have formal financial services. So if you frame it from the government's need perspective, because governments in Africa have lots of challenges. So when, you, when young people like them come in and it sounds like esoteric things that they're presenting to them, you have to present it from the government's perspective. That's what I think we will do. We do both venture capital, we've done three of them, and then we do quite a number of private equity in the technology space. So uh, this is how we've been able to overcome because policies don't move by themselves unless you frame it from the government. Just like if you talk to the agriculture minister, relate to him what the farmers are going to benefit from, not you, what your company is going to benefit from, because they might think you're just pure capitalists out there to rip off, you know, poor farmers. So the same thing on the technology space. What is this technology? The second and final point is more a comment is uh, social media. I think uh, it's su stuff that can be both a plus or destructive. And I think that's also needs to be addressed. I mean, as an American, I can relate to these things being invented in Silicon Valley. We've, we've invested in a company in Silicon Valley that's in that space. But when you bring it to Africa, sometimes it's seen as a threat, although we have to show them how you can monetize it as governments, how they can capitalize <coughs> on Twitter, Facebook, and other things that can actually, and the companies like Google, the benefits that they can bring, instead of switching it off whenever there's an election, or something like that that they don't like, okay? So I think you have to see it from their perspective in order for them to accept you as a partner that would solve the government's challenges in Africa. Thank you. Well, thank you, sir, and thank you for having faith in Africa, and I hope you do 10 times as many investments in the next few years. So, um, 
Julie, I'll give the last word to you, because I think that's a very interesting point, is you know, how do we get the governments even to come on board faster with all this innovation that's running ahead of them? Yes, you make a very good point. And um, what we try to do uh, most of the time is just linking uh, what we're doing to the government agenda. So for example, job creation. If we're training people and giving them skills, then they're likely to um, be more job ready, create opportunities for themselves, existing businesses can grow and so on and so forth and so um, talking to like the ministry the ministries of trade and commerce and investment and all that um, what we find is um, uh, sometimes with government it's uh, it's almost like taking two steps forward and one st and three steps backwards and also we talk about government as one entity but the experience with different arms of government is different so some are a lot more agile and a lot more responsive etc while some move a lot more uh, a bit more slowly and um, but overall i would say in the technology space we are seeing positive collaboration uh, on our initiatives. We have actually been able to collaborate with government to roll out uh, programs you know, uh, nationwide, like a, a digital skills training program, uh, support for tech hubs, and so on. And, and I agree that the conversation needs to continue, and it's important to continue to tie all these two. How does this benefit government's agenda and the economy? Thank you so much. I think we've run out of time. I just, uh, I know I've been inspired. I hope everyone in the room has been inspired by five incredible young people from Africa doing amazing things, and also about the power of innovation. As I said at the outset, we have no choice in Africa. So please, I want you to give it up, give a big hand. To